402 men, wounded, killed or missing. The woods around Overloon the woods around Overloon were covered with the debris of war. What motivated the Germans to offer such fanatical resistance when safe conduct dropped over the lines by the British guaranteed proper treatment after surrender? It was a catastrophe. I cannot explain today where we found the moral strength to go on fighting or why we did. We were told you cannot retreat. Behind you is the river Maas. The bridges have been destroyed. One had to do one's duty to obey orders. If not, and we must not kid ourselves, we would have been put against the wall. Many were hanged in the Heimat. On October 13, British newspaper announced that after heavy fighting, a loan was being held firmly by the British. On that same October 13, the second phase of Operation Aintree began. Initially, it had been planned for 9th Brigade to pass through positions taken the day before by 8th Brigade and then to advance on Fenray. As the battle had been heavier than expected, 185 Brigade, held in reserve, was now committed to battle. The Royal Ulsters and the King's own Scottish borderers of 9th Brigade were to mop up the woods to the right of the road to Venray. They were supported by two squadrons of tanks of the Grenadier Guards. And 185th Brigade's task was to clear the woods to the left of the road to Venray. They were supported by tanks of the Coldstream Guards. Leading this attack were the Warwicks and the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, followed by the Norfolks. The battalion of the Norfolks would then follow. The German opposition, however, was so fierce that none of the two battalions that were to follow came into action. The advance of the infantry was soon halted by mines. The tanks could do very little in the soggy field. Many a tank was hit or knocked out. On finally reaching the south edge of the woods, the infantry came under heavy machine gun fire in the open fields and under shell fire from the Sturmgeschütze. That day, the attack bogged down at the edge of the wood. We of the 9th Field Ambulance set up our section in a house which stood on the site of the new one over there and were attending to the wounded. During the lull in the wounded coming into us, one of my colleagues walked up from the house and walked over here to this farm behind me. And we noticed that the gable end of the building was down and there was the ruins of a crashed aircraft which turned out to be a thunderbolt. Uh, my colleague was inspecting the wreckage and he called me over after finding something he couldn't identify. And I came over and knelt down and we were very surprised to find out this was the body of a man badly burned and it looked exactly like a piece of wood. In Ostrom, in Ostrom the first shells came down and made two casualties. Fenray was continually attacked by the typhoons and shelled by artillery, causing a fire in the gymnasium of the Jerusalem boarding school in the afternoon. Smiddags brand uitbrak in het gymnasium van Jeruzalem. 
Een groep vrijwilligers van de brandweer bestreed. Een groep of volunteers of the fire brigade tried to extinguish the fire. The nurses home on the side of Sendanas where the cellars were chock full of patients was also set on fire by shells. Together with two men who were in hiding, I managed to move the fire engine up to the water supply near the nurses home. But Mother Godeliever, who was standing in the doorway, told me to go inside for cover as she clearly saw that I could never put out the fire all by myself. It was burning like a torch. The upper floors were being devoured by the flames in no time. Through the staircases, the fire spread rapidly to the cellars and Mo Mother Godeliever was forced to order the removal of the patients from the cellars to somewhere else. All this happened under heavy shell fire. Alle patiënten die in de kelders ondergebracht waren, om die te verplaatsen. Dit is gebeurd onder zwaar granaatvuur. Terwijl de dodelijk vermoeide en While the exhausted, decimated German forces were pushed back towards Fenray, the German high command decided to regroup the forces inside the bridgehead. At the castle of Geistre, Colonel Walter was replaced by Colonel Golsch, and the name of the force was changed into Kampfkuppe Golsch. From the southern edge of the bridgeheads near Romont, Lieutenant Colonel Leuftet Hardeck of Falschirmjäger Regiment. 21 was sent to Van Ray with a few small units. In October, I received orders to proceed to Van Ray with the staff of my regiment in order to reorganize the scattered units there into a Kampfgruppe and to defend the area of Van Ray until our forces would have retreated behind the River Mars. And the Raum Van Ray so long to defend die deutschen Truppen südlich über die Maas übergesetzt hatten. Das war etwa am 10. Oktober. This must have been on or about October 10. My regiment staff had been made available to me for this task, as my three battalions were already engaging the enemy on three points. We reported to a laundry in Venray, where I met the commander of the 107 Panzer Brigade. He had been in command of the fighting on the Venray front, and I had been ordered to take over from him. Battalion Paul, or rather what was left of it, had suffered severe losses, and my own 1st Battalion also came under my command, as well as my engineer company and my signals company. It was not a large force. Die ich mitgebracht hatte. Das war also keine große Streitmacht. Then October 14th dawned, an overcast day with bright sunny spells. Many vehicles bogged down in the muddy roads. The fields leading up to the Molenbeek, where the infantry attack had failed, could only be taken by attacking against fierce German resistance. Two battalions held in reserve were committed into action. On the western flank, the Lincolns, and on the eastern flank, the Norfolks. During this attack, McDermott was second in command of the Lincolns. The attack failed because of the heavy shelling and the open nature of the country and the company commander whose name was Smith brought down smoke and we retired to where we come from at the forward edge of the wood. Deliberation took place and in the afternoon a much heavier attack went in this time with tanks at uh, brigade level do you see and uh, aircraft too I think on the forward edge of the wood which were our objective 
And this time, the company, now at very much reduced strength, say, say 20 or 30 men, um, were reserved to the forward company, which was D Company. Again, there was much shelling directed from the church tower at Van Rye, and it was a very sad day for the, the regiment. We lost many men wounded. It had become obvious by now to the British that the church tower of Van Rey was an obstacle that blocked their advance. The Germans had set up an observation post in it, which signaled the British positions to their artillery and naval warfare with lethal effect. That whole day, the church tower became the target of typhoons. The tower was heavily damaged but remained standing. The Daily Herald of October the 16th carried as headline, Church Tower Stops Dempsey. Around the church, the heart of Van Ray was burning, the Hofstraat and the Jerusalem convent. In the meantime, the Germans had abandoned the tower, leaving their notes behind. The many refugees and the nuns of Jerusalem fled to St. Silvasius Psychiatric Hospital, according to Cor Janssen, one of the volunteers. When Jerusalem was attacked, the first few rockets smashed through the building, down into the cellar, and three rockets fell a few feet away from us without exploding. The second batch came down near our fire engine, which was blown into the air and fell upside down on the ground, which meant the total destruction of the equipment we had. From the Mass Ezoek, I was able to watch how the Hofstraat burned down and Jerusalem. It was a huge sea of fire, and it was impossible to reach the Hofstraat. Het was een enorme vuurzee. Het was onmogelijk om uh, de Hofstraat te bereiken, want bij uh, de winkels in de Hofstraat uh, daar kwamen For fire jets were hissing down from the shop windows across the street. A building like Jerusalem, with a large roof surface, causes a tremendous conflagration. Very impressive, but impossible for a fireman to do anything about. Dat geeft een, een geweldige vuurzee, zeer imposant, maar eh, jammer genoeg dat je dan als brandweerman in je eigen plaats daar verder niets meer aan kunt doen. Ten oosten van de weg naar Van Rij. East de of the road to Van Rij, the Norfolks were able to move forward in the direction of the Molenbeek. Among them were Captain Brian Balsam and Captain George Dix. I was in trenches about 50 to 100 yards behind him just by the main road. In the attack, I had lost two men killed and three wounded, and I myself had had two bullets through my haversack because I wasn't clever enough to crawl along the ditch at the side of the road low enough. But the rest of the day was very, very hectic. There was a German tank about 400 yards away towards Van Rai which was firing 88 millimeter shells with remarkable frequency in our direction. And in addition, the German multi-barreled mortar, the Nebelwerfer, was a very much a nuisance. In addition, in the attack, we had been supported by four Churchill tanks, and they had all been knocked out by this one German tank. In the meantime, the tanks of the Grenadier Guards succeeded in taking the wooded ground of Laagheide near Endepoel. The infantry came to grips with a German patrol consisting of young, inexperienced soldiers. Among them was Oswald Janssen, 18 years old, of Faunschirjäger Regiment 21. We did not have a clue as to the situation at the front, and our group of 12 men walk straight across the field into the British attack.
Over us was a British observer plane. We went back into the woods and there, without cover, we waited for the British attack. Ohne Deckung die englischen Soldaten. Jeder Every frontline soldier knows that it is tough to fight in woods. You see no one. There is no cover. Bullets come from all over the place. You have no sense of direction. Die Querschläger kommen von allen Seiten. Man hat kein Orientierungsvermögen. Man weiß ja nicht, wo die Schüsse herkommen. Und so war es auch hier in diesem Waldgebiet. The fight against the British took about 30 minutes. Three of us were killed. Our NCO received a fire burst from a submachine gun in his chest and was killed. We had three tote. Our underofficer bekam a machine pistol over the breast and was on the stelle tot. Also on the linker flank. Towards Fearing's Bake and Smacht on the left flank, the situation was not developing according to plan. The South Lancashire were facing stubborn resistance, the, despite the support by tanks of the Grenadier Guards. Near the hamlet of Scherzen, three of our tanks were hit by a German 88mm gun. One of the crew members was Colin Lamb. Uh, over on the left of us here, and we came across to the farm buildings to give covering fire for the infantry that were coming in with us. As we moved out from the cover of the farmhouses, we were fired upon by an 88 millimeter that was situate, situated in the woods beyond. We were hit in the turret, right on the side of the smoke racks, on the operator's side, which must have killed him instantly. He was my good friend, uh, Bob Garner. The concussion had blown me to the floor of the turret, and I could only see an inferno of burning and smoke. The noise of the penetration was horrendous. It was just as though a large giant had torn steel uh, in two. It was a tearing, it was a tearing, it was a tearing sound that is unforgettable. As we, as we were bailing out, I got to the pedestal where the tank commander usually stood and was about to bail out when we were hit again on the same side, in the same place. This knocked me down to the floor of the turret again. And the concussion of the second time was just as though someone had hit you in the face with a pillow. It was a dull thud. I recovered myself and decided that it was more than time to bail out I hadn't had any bailout signal uh, because it all happened too fast. I saw the light where the turret lid was open and I climbed up through the turret that was burning furiously by this time and bailed out. The driver, Nobby Green, having been hit the first time, had put the tank into reverse gear before he, put, he bailed out. The tank was moving backwards on its own accord and had travelled some few hundred yards by the time I bailed out. Being as it was moving, I hit the air louvers on the side of the tank uh, rather hard and then got up from the ground and tried to run for the cover of the farmhouse and the slit trenches that the Germans had left behind them. That evening, they sent tanks up to recover us and take us back to the field ambulance for treatment. There, we were put on a, uh, on a scout car and strapped onto a stretcher and driven through Overloom. <laughs> October 15 was a fairly quiet day. 
The next step for the British was to cross the Molenbeek, and their plan was as follows. Simultaneously, with 8 and 185 brigade crossing the Molenbeek, units of the 11th Armour Division were to attack from the east. During the night, the infantry were to cross the Beek by using Kapok bridges. The Norfolks and the Warwicks the were to cross on the left, the Suffolks and the East Yorks on the right. In het westen de Suffolks en de East Yorks. Achter de Lobeek. The Germans were waiting for them in their slit trenches behind the beak. The bridge across the beak had been blown up by them. They knew that the British were stronger than they and that it would be difficult to halt their advance. The Corps was also aware of this and in order to help the defenders something was done that was very unusual in war, namely mines were sown on either side of the Molenbeek without mapping them. The water level of the bake was raised by engineers so that the fields leading up to the bake were flooded to a level of about 40 centimeters, which made the area very difficult to cross. In the early morning hours of October the 16th, the leading forces of the British trudged to the soggy banks of the Beek. Captain Lewis Morgan Thomas of the Suffolks quickly ran into trouble. We knew and had been told that round here the Germans had laid many hundreds of shoe mines on both sides of this Molen Beek. In the event, nothing went to plan. It was raining pitilessly, and on both sides of the track leading to the beak, the ground had been churned up into a sea of mud by shell fire and the movement of the tanks trying to get over the beak. In addition, the shoe mines were far thicker in number than we had envisaged and already the battalion was suffering from casualties from people treading on the shoe mines. In addition, the abrays which were carrying the fascines also got bogged down in the mud on either side of the track here, and in consequence, we couldn't get the tanks over. In the event, B Company found themselves in the beak here under heavy shell fire, unable to move forward because they had no tank support. My company, as a follow-up company, was soon in the beak with them because we had been instructed to follow them quickly. In addition, the East Yorkshire Regiment, which was following behind, was located on either side of the track here and was unable to move forward because no bridgehead had been established. The position was now desperate. Tot overmaat van ramp. To make matters worse, a bridge-laying tank tumbled into the Molenbeek at the spot on the main road from Overloon to Venray, where the Germans had blown up the bridge. This left the Norfolks without tank support. Under cover of darkness, engineers had built a small bridge across the Molenbeek at the spot chosen by Terry, and so we all gathered for the attack. I moved up, and the intention was, of course, that we should move as quietly as we could, not to be observed, still using the darkness. And we moved across the bridge, and all would have gone very well. Most of our my men were across, when and there was a noise, not from our own people, but from a unit way over to the right. And the uh, tank opened up, and at that particular time, I lost 
a large number of men from one of my sections, including its section commander, Corporal Drake. But we still moved on towards our objectives. Not far from the railway line near Smacht, the attack by a unit of the Shropshires bogged down in the fire of machine guns of German paratroops. Sergeant George Ertley decided to tackle the job all by himself. He told his men to cover him and fire his stun gun from the hip and thrown hand grenades, he silenced three machine guns. For this act of bravery, Sergeant Ertley was awarded the highest decoration for valor of the British Army, the Victoria Cross. Again, the British opened up with a heavy artillery barrage on the north edge of Enray. 15,000 shells fell in the area between Overlonseweg and the Maasheseweg. Many houses were destroyed, and the St. Joseph convent was severely damaged. St. Anna's too was hit badly again. When trying to help a wounded British soldier on October the 16th, Piet van Kessel and Gerrit Ritter from The Hague, who'd gone into hiding in Van Rey, were badly injured. The event took place on the Laagheidseweg. At 7 o'clock in the morning, we saw a wounded British soldier lying in the field. We walked toward him, bandaged him, and wanted to take him to a Red Cross van which was standing a hundred yards down the road. In order to get there, we first had to cross a small temporary bridge. And then we had to cross a small temporary bridge. The bridge was broken. The red bridge was broken. The bridge was stopped. I was there not over. I had just crossed the bridge. Gerrit Ritter was on my left side when I stepped on a mine which tore off my left leg and the right leg of my friend. I fell on the ground and with my hand touched off another mine which exploded in my face. I slug my left bein off and my comrade's right bein. Glick pot. En nu viel ik naar hem. En kreeg ik nog hier aan mijn. Viel ik met de hand op en die kreeg ik nog hier recht in mijn gezicht. En dan hagen er pak zijn. Gerrit Ritter tied off his leg with his shirt and crawled out of the field toward the Red Cross van, which took him to the hospital in Helmond. I was left lying there. Ja, is dan daar aangekomen en dat verteld en toen is dan opgepakt en naar het ziekenhuis gebracht en maar onder de hand lag ik daar nog steeds. On October the 16th, we were ordered to rescue a badly wounded man from a German minefield. He had been there nearly all day. When we got onto this field, three of my comrades were injured by German shoe mines. One driver lost his foot, another one had severe facial injuries, and our captain uh, lost both feet. I heard people shouting, but I could not see any more. George Dix of the Norfolks also heard someone shouting when he and his men had cleared a farm of Germans on the Overlone Seveg. I now know, of course, that it was occupied by the Vetterhahn family. When we got there, we shooed away some 25 or 30 Germans who, who gave themselves up. And I was just settling down in, in my slip trench for a cigarette when I heard the, word, the cry, Kamerad. It seemed to come from the cellar, so I moved forward and looked into the cellar and there saw a very pit pitiable sight. The old man had an enormous cut across his head, his wife, two boys, two girls and a boy, and another little girl was dead. Uh, we got them out of the cellar, wondered what to do with them, because the old man certainly couldn't walk. 
And then we found a wheelbarrow in one of the uh, barns outside, and we persuaded the old man to get into the wheelbarrow, and we got the young boy, age 18, to trundle him off down the road, back to our lines, with the wife and two little girls following behind. Late in the middag, Late in the afternoon of October the 16th, the British had crossed the Molenbeek over the whole length of the front. Merselo was liberated by the 11th Armoured Division. The forward units advanced towards the outskirts of Venray and dug in there. After having been in action for more than 24 hours, there was rest and food at last. The fight for the Molenbeek had been a tough one and merited a special order of the day by General O'Connor, who congratulated all his men on their fine performance, but in particular 185 Brigade. In the meantime, the Germans, aware that the battle was lost, committed a final shameful act, the total destruction of the age-old church tower of St. Peter's Church. Hundreds of kilos of TNT reduced the tower to rubble. The windmill of Van Aersens, the church towers of Oostrum and Eiselstein, and the water towers of St. Salvatius and St. Annas were dealt with in the same way. J. Arians of the Hotestad had already expected the destruction of the tower. I was plugging up the little windows in our cellar there were about 10 people in there when a German soldier came along and said that he needed a heavy hammer. The church tower was to be blown up. He asked me where he could find the blacksmiths and I told him there were no blacksmiths here. There was one, Tun de Han, but I said he'd better go down to Lukasa, a little bit further down the street hoping that as there were shells were falling all over the place, that perhaps a piece of shrapnel might hit him in the head, which might save the tower. He took my advice, and as a parting shot, I said, everything here has been destroyed. So has all Germany, he retorted. As the shelling increased, I went back inside, and as the German walked down the Paterstraat, an hour later, I heard a heavy thud. It seemed as if the cellar was moving, and I thought to myself, that's the end of the tower. I said nothing, and as I left the cellar, yes, the tower was gone. I am very sorry about what happened with the church tower. I like the church. We have never blown up churches at least not under my command. In the early morning of October 17, though later than planned, the British forces moved in for a concerted attack on Van Rey. The front line was as follows, the Suffolks near the Hipt, the East Yorks in Brabander and the Warwicks on the edge of the woods of St. Annas. As the Suffolks approached the woods of the Heap, they were opposed by a German section that had not dug in too well. And as there was no tank support yet, Captain Morgan Thomas decided to carry out a bayonet attack. Three, two, one, charge, and in we went for the 20 yards, firing from the hip and bayoneting when we got to the slit trenches. I went on with the leading platoon of my company that my sergeant reported to me that he had captured we had captured eight germans austrians i believe and killed and wounded six others after this episode we cleared the woods to the south and then returned back
to the hospital in Van Ray, where we dug in. The East Yorks. The East Yorks continued their advance towards Van Ray. One of the sections was fired upon by a German machine gun and were ordered to silence it. Corporal Hall came face to face with the tragedy of war. We took up our positions to run across the field and get to the edge and then move up the edge and silence the gun. Our officer was a Canadian officer and we set off running and they started firing and when we get halfway across a German sniper jumped out of one of the furrows in the ground and put his hands on his head and said Finney Caput and the Canadian officer put his revolver in his back and said run run you bastards run and we ran until we got to the to the dip where we could get down and shelter from the gun and the officer turned to me and said shoot him corporal and the next man to me was a chap called Payne and I said shoot him Payne so Payne shot him and the German fell and pointed to his head like that and Payne shot him in the head eventually we moved up the up the edge and silenced the gun and everything was all right until we got to Van Ray. well Payne had a friend an older soldier Payne was only 19 and the older soldier was 28 and they were a team fighting as a team and this day in Venray the early morning used to be terrible shelling from the Siegfried line and Dawson said he was going to look for some fat so as we could have some chips he went and we never seen him again until we was doing a patrol and we found him with no head on. Well, Payne, when he saw, saw his friend, he literally collapsed. He started crying real big tears and emotionally he was finished. He couldn't hold a limb still. All his webbing and everything fell off of his arms he, wa he was spent absolutely finished a section of the East Yorks had passed the signpost of Van Ray on the Overloan Road near Café Oudenhoven they were fired upon by German snipers hidden in the gardens of St. Joseph Company and their advance was halted abruptly. In complete disregard of the actual situation, a jeep of the field ambulance drove straight into the market square of Van Ray. In the jeep was Arthur Abbott, medical sergeant. As we got towards Van Ray, we saw no troops, either German or British, and drove straight into the market square. We stopped just by the town hall. The, the doctor started to look at his map to see our whereabouts, and I just glanced round the square. I was surprised to see German soldiers emerging from all over the place. They surrounded the jeep and came towards us. They asked us our business. We told them we were looking for wounded. They said, uh, you are prisoners. You come with us. And they took us to a school somewhere on the outskirts of Van Rye, and we were taken down in the cellars there for interrogation. After our interrogation, we were taken into Germany in the Neukirk Krefeld area. 
This is a very useful item in a war, and as I had lost my own leather map case, I took this wooden case as loot from the British medical officer, and I made very good use of it. At St. Anna's, the Warwicks had reached the first few pavilions in the early mornings. The first people they saw were a few nurses. And I thought to myself, I must be Gaga, I must be seeing things. I asked another nurse to come and have a look, and she saw it too. Sure enough, it was a Tommy. He had branches on his helmet. We rushed up the stairs and applauded him. The Tommy was very moved when he saw how we were living with the patients in the cellar. And soon a few more Tommies joined him, and they gave us cigarettes and chocolate. They really spoiled us. That moment was heaven on earth for us. Sister Godelieve, Mother Superior of St. Anna's, was told that the first British soldiers had arrived at St. Anna's. She did not understand why the shelling of the buildings continued. The situation in the cellars was desperate by now. We were all very frightened. People were standing around, praying, filled with fear. They were mental patients, and those faces, I will never forget them. There were hundreds of them in the cellars of the main building. Alone there were four or five hundred people. Sister Godeliva then decided to inform the British that the situation had become desperate, that there were no Germans at St. Anna's anymore, and that there were only nurses and patients left. Jan van Kessel took a letter to the British lines. Luckily, he returned safely after an hour or so, and soon the shelling stopped completely. After the gardens of the St. Joseph's convent had been cleared, the East Yorks and the South Lancashires entered Venray. As I came round that bend, the man in front of me was hit, hit full, in the, full in the body with machine gun fire from further up the road and fell dead in the road here. Uh, then, after, fire, after killing my comrade, he gave himself up and came out with his hands held above his head and, marked, and walked down the centre of the street. Uh, luckily, he, he got down to the end unscathed, but it was a terrible act to do and then give himself up in such an easy way. We then walked on, went on the end of the street and cleared out to the end of the street before um, holding our position. A section, from the East Yorks, the A section of the East Yorks entering Van Ray via the Gaststadt soon ran into German opposition. Many a house was fired upon. The house of the Beckskens family on the corner of the Gaststadt and the Masseesrecht came under mortar fire, this in order to chase the Germans away. After a while, the British forced the back door and searched the house. When the British entered my house that afternoon, I said, hello, and beckoned them to come further. They ate some fruit, left through the back door, and returned with another lot, who set up a first aid post. Under cover of smoke against snipers, the Marseilleweg could be cleared. Every house was searched. In the house of the De Raad family, a few exhausted Germans were captured, and it would appear that the bulk of the German forces had already abandoned Venray. Mm. 
On October the 17th, a few hours before noon, it became clear that the Germans were pulling out. They came down the Smaktfeldweg from the direction where rang Xerox is today, all walking through the ditches alongside the road to protect themselves against bullets and shrapnel. In the afternoon, a German soldier came down the stairs of the cellar and said that the British would be there in a few minutes. He advised us to stay in the cellar as the British would not harm us. He closed the door of the cellar behind him and we heard his footsteps fade away. A little while later, we smelled smoke. One of us went upstairs and saw that the farm was on fire. We hurriedly left the cellar. German soldiers, watching the fire, helped the women and took them to a barn at the far end of the yard. On the evening of that same day, at about ten past six, sitting in our cellar, I heard footsteps overhead. I left the cellar and on the landing I met a few Englishmen who, with fixed bayonets, were searching the house. Their first question was whether there were any Germans inside, and I told them that there were none. The same evening they went back to where they came from, and we were left in no man's land. There were no British, nor Germans. There were times when the fighting, for some inexplicable reason, seemed to stop. Such a lull in the fighting caused a delay in the liberation of St. Servatius until October the 18th. The situation had become unbearable for the residents and for the many refugees who were sheltering there. Food supplies dwindled rapidly and there was no more electric power. Then we found that the Germans had blown up the water tower and had destroyed the engine room, so we had no power anymore. Together with our blacksmith, we mounted a bicycle on a standard, turned it into a blower and placed it in front of the steam boiler. This produced enough oxygen for the boiler to maintain a good fire and provided enough steam for the kitchen. Van die aanjager, dan kreeg ik uh, zuurstof voldoende in die ketel om een flink vuur te onderhouden van de, kotel, van de kolen die erin gegooid werden. En zodoende had ik stoom in de keuken. Maar als je er tien minuten op die fiets. But after ten minutes on that bike in the cellar, sweat came pouring down your pants. So bloody hot it was in there. Maar het was dan zo warm, hè? Ja, dan was het hier te gaar en dan. After the food had been cooked. It had to be distributed among the people in the various cellars, and this often caused trouble. The passages were very narrow, and because there were so many people, it sometimes was not easy to get through with the food. At three o'clock in the early morning of October the 18th, the British artillery, supported by mortars, started a terrible bombardment on Venray. It was one of the worst episodes of the battle for the citizens. The village was razed by shellfire, but for a few isolated places where a sniper was holding out, then Ray was entirely in British hands that morning. At the same time, units of the British 11th Armoured Division liberated Eiselstein and Heide. Near Veulen, the British ran into strong German opposition. At this point, my leading section spotted a German tank about 300 yards along the road, tucked in to the side of the ditch. Word, we halted, and word was passed back that there was a German panzer to the front, and three of our Shermans moved out to the left flank to see if they could deal with it. Unfortunately, it had the better of them and knocked two of them out 
uh, and only the third managed to make its way back onto the road. This marked the limit of our advance in Verlin, and it was to be well over a fortnight before any further advance could be made. A day after the liberation, a start was made with the evacuation of patients and staff of St. Anna's. They were taken to Buchel, Wunzel, and the Karel I cigar factory at Eindhoven. The same day, Lonen was liberated. With the Germans retreating in southeasterly direction of Venray, Orlo and surrounding areas had to be evacuated. The mayor of Venray and his son Vic, who were still hiding there, returned to Venray. They arrived at the house of Dr. Sala on the Oostsingel. There was a high-ranking officer there and a few Dutchmen. My father told them that he was the mayor of Venray and that he was on his way to the St. Joseph convent where my mother and three brothers were staying. There my father and I went into the cellar and I remember vividly how they embraced and how glad they were to see each other again. Dat mijn vader en moeder elkaar zagen in de kelder bij de kinderen. En inderdaad, de dokter die komt met zijn patroon. De German doctor in a white coat walked in and said that he needed the kitchen. The living room was to be the operating theater. Nou, wat ik toen heb gezien, dat is, dat zal ik nooit vergeten. Hey, die soldaat die lagen dus op die stroommat, waar anders de koeien staan. And the, and the doctor comes and the cake, you know, Wounded the soldiers cake. were laying about on straw. The doctor the kicked each boy against the sole of his boots and without asking them how they felt, said, get up, all of you, get your rifle and hand grenades and off to the front. And he said, everyone, without asking how they felt, get up, Geweer, handgenaten, alles is fertig en hop naar die front. Steeds meer Engelsen. More and more British soldiers entered Fenway. Many were billeted at St. Sylvester's and in private homes. The German artillery shelled Fenway regularly and caused many casualties, among whom Vicar Olieslager. Since Sylvester's was also shelled and many buildings were damaged. In the, in the damned cellars there were still some 1500 people and the situation was intolerable. On October 22nd it was decided to evacuate the people of St. Sylvester's. A major banger, king of the East Yorks, was placed in charge of the operation. Red Cross vans drove in front of the asylum, and everything was put in readiness for the journey to the Van Horne barracks in Weert. On October the 16th, General O'Connor was ordered to halt Operation Aintree. Opening up the Scheldt estuary had been given top priority now so that the port of Antwerp could be used as supply port. The front line was to remain where it was, from Mass Hayes in a slight curve to the southwest via Van Rey, passing beyond St. Servatius and Veulen to Grinsveen in the direction of Niederweert. This doomed Van Rey to remain a frontline town. On October 25, the Germans dynamited the church tower of Kastenrij. That same day, civil affairs decided on the complete evacuation of Van Rey. Everybody had to leave, including patients and staff of St. Elizabeth's Hospital. The square in front of the hospital was turned into a general assembly point. Gatje Hermsen and his family went there also. At 10 o'clock in the morning, my wife, myself, my child and my mother-in-law, together with our baggage, we were told what was going to happen and were loaded into trucks and set, sent off in the direction of Merselo, Dürne 
Nachtingau, and from there to Lissel. In Lissel, the people were temporarily housed in the camp of Freiberg, where they were examined and deloused. Everybody was registered and received an identity card. Army trucks took them to Bakel, where they stayed for a while in an empty school. Here they were given food and were told what family in the area they would stay with. They were taken there by small vans. They were warmly received and found a safe place to stay behind the front line. With the liberation of Smakt, Oostum, Orlo and Kastenrai at the end of November 1944, the bloody battle of Overloon and Venray was over at last. Overloon and Venray had been badly damaged and offered a pitiful sight that people dispersed in various directions, their homes looted. Nearly 300 citizens lost their lives and many were wounded. The Allies had lost hundreds of casualties. 212 British soldiers suffered from battle exhaustion. The German losses were many times larger than those of the Allies. The dead remained behind, the British, the Americans and the Germans, buried in separate cemeteries, headstones with names, often without. Soon after the liberation, a museum was set up in Overloon to keep the memory of those horrible days of war alive. Nor shall we ever forget our liberators, certainly not those who made the highest sacrifice their lives for our freedom.